I'm Dr. Winnie King, and I'm coming to you right from the lobby of the Children's Hospital at Montefiore in New York City. Did you know that more than one out of every 100 kids has epilepsy? Whitney King is one of them. Come and listen as Jim Bunn tells her story. A healthy baby, Whitney King, her mom's first little girl. She did all the things little girls do, and some of the things mostly done by little boys. But for her mother, something was wrong. It was just that strange look. I would see it every once in a while. In the beginning, I didn't see it often. She was about seven. It, you know, some kids daydream that way. They look and they'll stare off and then they'll come back. Um, I, to me, it was more like a blank look in her eye, I noticed. It was epilepsy. Those daydreaming spells were actually petty mall or absent seizures. They last just a few seconds. Doctors said Whitney would probably outgrow it within a couple of years. So every two years, we would hope we were hoping this is going to be the year she outgrew it. It didn't happen. You're looking at a remarkable home video that shows Whitney having a seizure right in the middle of a swim meet. Watch closely. It looks like she just stopped swimming. Her arm drapes over the lane divider, and that quickly, it's over. A petty mall or absence seizure. Eventually, she had over 130 seizures like this every day. About a year after the seizures began, the family left Alabama and moved to Connecticut. There, the seizures continued, but they continued to be the more mild kind, the kind that made it seem like Whitney was just daydreaming. Then the family moved here, Charlotte, North Carolina, where one day it became clear that Whitney's epilepsy had gotten worse, much worse. I panicked and I said, oh no, this is it. You know, what I've been dreading for years, hoping would never come. Right when it started coming, I realized this is it, it's coming. Whitney was having her first tonic, clonic, or grand mal seizure, the worst kind. She started to get a little confused. She started talking and I realized something was not right. Just her speaking started changing and I jumped up and then she started shaking at first and guttering some sounds and her face turns and she shakes and the air is being pushed out of her lungs. You can hear the noise and she falls down and goes unconscious. There watching was Whitney's younger sister, Mackenzie. I think I was about close to being six and she was about 13. Epilepsy now consumes Whitney's life. I take 10 pills a day, but that's not as bad. I used to take up to like 14 to 16. And some of that medicine is to help you with seizures and some of that medicine is to, to... help you with the side effects from the first yes. medicine. Yes, <laughs> It's craziness. Once a rising star in an Olympic level swimming program, Whitney's seizures got worse. Hospitalized, new drugs helped, but they made her lose her hair and she gained 35 pounds. You can't pick and choose what you have. I've learned to accept that. I just have to build it back up, and it gives me something to work for. She cannot accept this. Recently, her little sister, Mackenzie, was diagnosed with epilepsy, too. I started bawling. I was crying as I was on the way home from school. My mom picked me up that day, and I just remember crying the whole way home. And we are joined by Kim, Mackenzie, and Whitney right here on the show. Welcome all of you to the Thank show today. You. We're so glad to have you here. Mackenzie, you've sort of seen this whole thing with your sister, and now you've been told that you have seizures. How does that make you feel? Are you angry or afraid? Um, sort of sad because you have to take these big pills and um, you have to wear this bracelet sort of every day, and sort of scary too. Yeah, well, you know, Kim, it's sort of like, here we go again with you. You know, you went through this whole ordeal with your oldest daughter, and now here you're going through it again. How, how are you feeling about all of this? Well, I realize you have to be an advocate for your child's education. Um, Whitney fell through the cracks when she needed special assistance, and it was not there for her. Um, so Mackenzie, I'm starting it in the elementary level, putting a plan in place yeah. in case she may need it. She may not sure. need special assistance when she gets older. So it's there so she can continue to be a successful student. What have you learned through all of this that's going to help you get through this a lot easier with Mackenzie? That the children are normal children and they can just lead a normal life. Um, you know, they need to sleep more. There are certain um, things they need, but 
that she'll just get through it and yeah. she'll be fine. Are you worried about the school experience that she's going to have to face? Yes, I am, only because what I've been through with Whitney. Yeah. Um, I felt like it did affect her future. We didn't get the help when we needed the help. Mm -hmm. And she's now applying to colleges, and it's showing right now. Yeah. Um, when we needed it, it wasn't there. Right, right. Well, so. you know, we're going to uh, talk about that whole school issue in just a minute. But first, I want you to meet Dr. Solomon Moshe, or Nico as he prefers to be called. He's the Director of Child Neurology and Clinical Neurophysiology at the Children's Hospital of Montefiore. And also please meet Dr. Stephen Wolf. He's the Director of Pediatric Epilepsy at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City. And welcome both of you to the show. Uh, Nico, I want to start with you. What, what is a seizure exactly? Uh, it's like having an electrical storm. Something happens. Most of the time is we have brain cells. It's like uh, two people talking on the phone. And there is static on the phone. And the two cells cannot communicate with each other. And that's a seizure. Yeah. And afterwards, there may be a little bit of an aftermath, but then it goes away. Yeah. Well, Nico, there are different types of seizures. Can you help us to understand what the types are? Sure, there are many kinds. I will talk quickly about three of them because one of them you've already seen. You've seen Whitney seizures, which is the absence seizures that you stare into space, and they can happen many, many times a day. A very scary type of seizure is called grand mal seizure, tonico-clonic seizures, that the, and we may see a seizure later on of this, uh, that all the limbs move at the same time. But the more common type is called a partial seizure, and there the person loses awareness with the environment and may be associated with feelings of fear, which may be part of the seizure, or the fear of having a seizure that may bring out more movements. Yeah. So that's important to know. And sometimes it's a smell that people have. I think most folks are not aware of that being a type of seizure. Yes, they have a funny sense of smell or a funny taste. And sometimes they even may see a picture in front of them that keeps on coming and coming. Well, let's take a look at some real seizures, because if you're not used to them, they can look a little scary. Now, this is a grand mal seizure, and this is a little scary looking, isn't it? And then here, later on, you're going to see what's called a partial seizure, and it looks like this. The person appears confused and can't interpret what's going on. Can you hear me? Hmm? Hmm. Are you okay? Oh. Nico, are seizures ever dangerous? If they last for a very, very long time, if the grand mal seizures last for a very, very long time, they can be dangerous. Yeah. Well, you know, time gets really strange when you're watching a seizure. You'll swear it was 10 minutes or, you know, and it was really just 10 seconds. How much time should really elapse with a seizure before you really need to call 911? First, you look at the watch because you really have no idea how long the time goes. Uh, if the seizure is a tonic-clonic seizure, grand mal seizure, and they last more than three minutes, then it's time to start calling uh, 911. Most okay. of the seizures will stop within three minutes. The partial seizures can go for a longer period of time and we may not need to call 911. The seizures that may scare us as the tonic clonic seizures. Yeah. Well, Stephen, I want to ask you about sleepovers because, you know, kids sleep over. They go to other people's homes and have fun and, you know, have parties. Can children with epilepsy go to sleepovers and spend the night outside their home? And the most important message we want everybody to know is that these children are normal and they should be treated like normal children and they should have normal sleepovers. The most important is communication between both sets of parents, letting the parents whose house they're sleeping over know what to expect. It maybe this is a child who if they get sleep deprived that will trigger a seizure so maybe they need to set the bedtime at a certain time. So I think just letting the family know what to expect should eliminate any concerns and that way the child can live a normal life. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk in a little bit later on in the show about what to do if someone's actually having a seizure, how you can be helpful. But uh, Stephen, let's talk about treatments. Do we have medications out there that are helpful? We're very lucky. There are a number of medications that are now available. And the goal of a medication is to stop the seizures with the least amount of side effects. And one, and if one medicine isn't right for a child, we'll pick another medicine and keep trying until we get it right. All right. Can you have surgery to correct seizures? I mean, can you just fix it in the operating room? In some cases, yes. In children who don't respond to medications, they might be a very good candidate, and that's something the family should discuss with their doctors. Yeah, good. Well, unfortunately, one consequence that often results from epilepsy is that kids and families are stigmatized and treated like outcasts. Here's just one small example from a parent. The children were so terrible to her. One time at the end of the year, I don't know if I told you this, but she, she slapped a girl. And my daughter is not like that at all. And I said, what happened? And she was all trembling when I came to pick her up after school. And she said, I couldn't handle it. Um, they were making fun of me. 
and I just lost my temper, Mom. And the school said, we still have to punish her. And I said, okay, fine. But what about the rest of the class? And they said, well, they didn't do anything wrong. I said, I'm sorry, they did. Well, that type of harassment is all too typical for these kids. I want you to meet Erica Dole. She is the Director of Education for the Epilepsy Foundation here in New York City. And welcome to the show. We're so glad that you were here. We really want to speak to parents with kids who have seizures, but also parents who have kids that don't have seizures. What do those families need to know about seizure disorder? Those families need to know that the kids with epilepsy need to be treated just the same as they were before they were diagnosed. The kids can still play together, they can have sleepovers, they can interact with one another. There might still be special considerations such as medication or rest, but to treat the child as normally as possible. Yeah, and tell us how much of a problem this stigma can be for families, how upsetting it can be for them. It can be really difficult. I think that kids can be cruel at really any age, and it's so really, really important to give people the right information tell them that seizures are not contagious, that kids can't catch them from their friends. It doesn't mean that they'll have to go into special schools or anything like that. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned that issue of contagiousness, because a lot of people, it looks so scary until they start to think, ooh, if I hang around that person, I might get seizures too. This is not a contagious disorder. Absolutely not. You can't get it from sharing a spoon or a fork no. or sleeping with someone in the same bed or playing or swimming. There's nothing about this that you can pass from one person to the next. Exactly. Okay, exactly. so no reason to be afraid. Well, you know, the best way to understand what it's like to be a kid with epilepsy is to get to know them. Now, you've met Mackenzie and Whitney. Now come visit a group of teenage girls with epilepsy who meet every month with a mediator to talk about their lives. I've had three seizures in my school, mm. two last year, and one this year on the first day of school. To hear what epilepsy is like from the kids who live with it, and to find out what you should do if someone has a seizure, click on part two of Epilepsy, One in a Hundred Kids.